This is a video. We're going to react to this video. It's from Legendary Drops. Here's the link in the Twitch chat. Here's the link in the YouTube chat. There will be a link in the descriptions down below as well. I interviewed Path of Exile's director on games' biggest issues in Path of Exile 2. Let's have a look at it. It is behind having a successful live service game so we could share it with the world. One of the things that I've always wanted to do was to sit down with someone that has a successful game or a successful live service game and dissect the inner workings of it to understand how they know the player's perspective so well and how they can deliver a game that players actually want to play. And in this case, well, we get to do just that. I got the opportunity to sit down with Jonathan Rogers, one of the co-founders and the technical director of Grinding Gear Games, Path of Exile 1, game director, and their upcoming right? game, Path of Exile 2. This is an incredibly special conversation where we get to talk about both games, the success of the first one, and what the, we get to look forward to in the second one. But even more so, I even go in to talk about some of the issues that I'm seeing in the games industry today. We have a little bit of back and forth on that as well. This is a very special interview, a very cool video. I am so happy to share this with you guys. It would not have been possible if it wasn't for you in the first place. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to reach these people. So I have to thank you for this. And this video is that thank you. Enjoy. True. So you're one of the founders of Grinding Gear Games. Uh, what led you guys to make Path of Exile? And did you guys think you would make it this far? So um, I actually um, was one of the founders straight out of university. Um, okay. uh, I was friends um, with Chris, who, you know, he, he was basically my best friend through university. And uh, we kind of, I mean, I, I knew I wanted to be a game developer from the point I was like 10 years old, right? Like I was doing game development, like as a, as a hobby right from that point. So it really wasn't a question of like, was I going to be a game developer? It was a question of like, how is that going to happen? Um, and Chris... Um, he was actually the one who sort of suggested, look, what we need to be doing is uh, making a, a sequel to Diablo 2. <laughs> that was basically his, uh, his his view on things. And I obviously love Diablo 2 as well. Yeah. Um, but um, like it, I, I wasn't like at the time when he was suggesting this, I wasn't still a player of it. You know what I mean? Like I'd played it a huge amount um, um, earlier, but uh, Chris was still deep in uh, Diablo 2 and um, obviously loved the game. Um, but he just made a really good case for the fact that, um, you know what, like there hasn't been a game that got the whole formula right um, for a really long time. Um, like, there was no evidence at the time true. that Blizzard was making it, right? Like, we just had Very no true. idea. Yeah, there was, like, um, a 10-year uh, wall or yeah, something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was that, because, I mean, I, I'm, the, 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 that's a whole thing. But effectively, they hadn't announced anything, you know, like, we, as far as we were concerned, it was just, like, here's just a game that was still selling, by the way. Like, people were still selling physical copies of Diablo 2. Yep. Like, it might have been, like, 10 years later or something like that. There was, there was still, the game was still selling, like, hotcakes. <laughs> it was, and it's, like, okay. it was, it's still true. good today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there were, there were, there were, there were, there were you, you, and so you had a game, and it's like, okay, no one's made like a true successor to this thing. It's still selling in stores. Obviously, people, you know, there's still a huge amount of demand for this stuff. Um, why the hell, uh, you know, like, are we not the ones doing this? So, um, yeah, I mean, basically, we, um, uh, you know, we, we, we decided, hey, we'll just get started. Um, and I, I was doing a lot of hobby game development. Um, Chris uh, had done a little bit of that, but um, you know, he was actually doing some security stuff, um, and. The uh, we were just like okay, like well, well, let's just do it then. So yeah, we just started writing code and and, and getting things done, and um, you know, it, we went a long way. And uh, you know, I remember at the very beginning because like we we actually did like think okay, well, what is the um, what 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 would uh, success look like um for doing this? Like what like if we're gonna do this, like what 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 would we have to actually achieve? And the, the thing that we um thought that we needed to achieve was effectively ten thousand concurrent players. Um, that was the amount that we uh sort of worked out that if we had that. Um, the amount of money that we would be making would be able to support the studio um, and everything would be okay. So that was kind of our, like, what, you know, what we were trying to do. Um, so anything beyond that point, as far as we were concerned, was just gravy. You know what I mean? Like, everything yeah. everything beyond that was great. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we and we pretty much achieved that, like, right from the start. Um, like, we, yeah. we, we, we the, as soon as we uh, had our closed beta, like, you know, things were going well and the company just did really well. So, yeah, it's been, um, it's been pretty crazy. <laughs> but uh yeah i mean as i said like that was kind of our thing like we we never really uh at the time sort of thought that we like we weren't thinking like we had to be the biggest game ever we were just like we can be sustainable if we have ten thousand concurrent users so that's the audience we need to attract if we can do that then, we, then, then we're then we good and um so that was kind of our thinking i think the sort of the grander scale is, is something that um yeah it wasn't really in our mind yeah uh so i mean Obviously, Path of Exile has been a bit of a standout success, especially like with free-to-play games, ARPG specifically. I still think there's not a lot of competition out there. Even right. even you guys saw an opportunity. And I mean, we've had a couple of games come out over the last few years, but 
uh, mm-hmm. nothing in the same vein. What do you guys attribute to the game's longevity and its success? So when we started, um, I guess what we saw was there were kind of like five pillars to make a good action RPG. Um, like there's what there's what and, and, and these are the things that we thought, okay, like there are people who have some of these, but there's no other game that has all of them except uh for Diablo 2. <laughs> so uh the first one um would be um well I mean in, in no particular order. Um you've got uh, random level generation. Yep. For longevity, you just need to have it. You need to have it, I mean you need to do it well. Because yeah. if you don't have that, I mean look, things are just going to get boring um very quickly. You've just played through the same thing a thousand times. I mean obviously even with random level generation that can still happen, but it takes a lot longer. Uh, the next thing is um, a secure online economy. Um, so effectively, you have to have the ability to trade items, and it has to be secure in the sense that nobody can dupe them. There's no cheats. There's nothing like that. Like that's really important for that long-term feeling because it makes the stuff that you find feel like it has value. Yeah. Yes. Um, which I think is very important for the long term. I'm gonna um, pause it there. This is gonna be a long reaction check here. That is so important. And Chris Wilson has also said uh, many years ago how if how sensitive and important and uh, crucial trade and value of items are for the game the economy of the game is super important and the reason for this is like when every time they've had a moment where like oh shit duplications are going they smack the hammer down hard they've had leagues in the past where they re-rolled back because of an issue like that to make sure that it does not compromise the integrity of the economy other games don't do that. And duplicates run rampant from day one. I'm not going to say other which games, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, the next one is that you have to have um, random a random item system. So, um, And what I mean by that, what I mean is, is like the item system has to have elements of chance. Um, and it has to be that anything you kill could be the thing that could drop the next amazing thing that you need to find. So um, in practice... Um, since we launched we have also added more deterministic things as well which i think do have a place but you certainly need like the it needs to be that just killing any random monster could be the one that drops like the amazing item like you still need that feeling all the time otherwise um you know you you like if you don't have that then what happens is that you see then uh, you finish a grind and then the next giant grind is like stretching out ahead of you and if like if you don't think you're going to get any rewardingness until the point where you finish that, that's a good moment that you might choose to quit. So um, that's actually one of those things that um, is, is, is really important as well. Yeah. Um, the next one is, is you need um, action combat. And at the time, the reason why what we were talking about there is as opposed to the kind of more MMO style combat that you had back then, which was like very like, you know, like just everything's on cooldown, like you have a million abilities and it's just kind of like one thing after another. That sort of cooldown rotation, like sort of slower paced combat that you had um, from the MMOs at the time. Um, and was that all of them, or did I say four? I can't quite remember now. Um, uh, where, where was I up to? Uh, uh, on this one? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe, I think so. No, 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 right. So there was the other one. The other one was... A, a deep, you said the loot uh, and the action combat and the yeah, trading. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the, a deep system of character customization. So effectively, you need enough depth in the way that you build your characters to make it so that you're willing to play through the same character, um, so not through the same character, through through the game again, um, but with a different build so that that can still be interesting to you. Um, and um, that was something that um, D2 didn't really have as much. Um, but one thing D2 did have was the concept of the ladder reset, which is effectively like yeah. the fresh economic start. And yeah. that... That was like one of the things we talked about that before. I don't know what if there was any game that did that beforehand in the ARPG world or scene. Uh, Diablo 2 introducing the ladder resets was like the one thing that led into this whole seasonal game, which is how ARPGs are played exclusively more or less these days. Like every ARPG game runs season cycles, leagues, whatever the fuck people call it. Uh, because of that, and that all spawned from the latter resets in D2. That concept um, was ultra important because, um, and, if, and if, once again, if you're doing ladder resets, then you need to, um, uh, you know, have the ability for your character to be different every time. There needs to be lots of build variety and things that you can do. So that you lots feel like you have of build variety, by the way. Well. Lots. So um, those are kind of the like five <clears> pillars <throat> that we had. And um, I think that really, like, um, at this point, the one that I think uh, a lot of companies still don't have, um, the ones that I think the companies still often don't do, one of them is um, they're really afraid to um, do full economic resets where there's absolutely zero progress that carries on um, between the leagues. Um, 
that's something that um, so a lot of companies are doing seasonal content now but um the thing that after they do the first one that players will always say is oh we want you to have some way to skip the campaign we want to have some way to like you know to yeah. blah, 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 keep right they're gonna say that right but i think it's actually ultimately long term um very harmful because um it means that uh like when, when you have a full economic reset uh it means that before he answers this a lot of people say that to this day in PUE, and it's been out for over a decade, right? People want to be able to skip campaign. And GGG has always had the argument, which he's about to explain now, with how it's harmful for the game to have that. And I, I'd, I'd like to listen in to what Jonathan will say about this, but a lot of people keep asking about this. Every time we have an interview with them, there's always a lot of people that are saying in chat that I should ask them about, oh, can we get a, a campaign skip? No, they will never do that, ever. New players can join your game <clears throat> and not feel like they're behind everyone. Like, they're behind everyone in terms of knowledge, but they're not behind everyone in terms of, like, you know, physically speaking, everyone yeah. who starts a part of Exile League ha is on the same playing field, ex apart from what they know about the game. So um, I think that's um, super important. So that's one that a lot of companies still aren't doing. But the other one as well that a lot of companies um, don't do is um, item trade. Uh, with 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 no uh, binding of items, and so yep. that that really keeps yep. the value. And a lot of companies are very afraid to do that. Um, and uh, you know, like it, it's, it's one of those things I think is, is is ultra important. Like it leads to so many problems, and people look at the problems and they assume that those problems are worse than the benefit. And yeah. I think that's partly because the benefit is a little bit more in, uh, intangible. Like it's harder to kind of appreciate the value that players feel. Like because it's kind of you know like it doesn't even kind of matter initially, and it kind of it's like one of those longer term kind of like concerns. But um, I think that that is really valuable, and um, it's something that uh, I wish more games would do. I'm actually really happy you said something about that because I think it's one of the things where, like, I look at you guys. I also like I play Warframe. That's one of my big games, right? And you guys are very similar in that, with like being able to trade loot and whatnot. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. so many games stay away from that, and mm -hmm. I think it just it adds so much more value, not only to what the player finds in the game, but mm -hmm. uh, like. I don't really know how to put my finger on it exactly, but I think it actually does have something to do with those concurrent player numbers, and it's something that brings yeah. players back because they know, no matter what, when they're playing the game, that you know there's really nothing keeping them from reaching the rest of the players that might be ahead of them. Right, right. <laughs> so yeah, that's 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 cool. Um, <laughs> so uh, where was I at? So oh, uh, you guys already have a successful game with Poe. You guys could mm -hmm. have just visually updated it and continued to grow it. Why did you guys choose to it's... make a second game, making PoE two, and also why did you choose to support both? So um, it's funny because we kind of creeped towards it in a strange way. Um, the very so the very initially, um, the plan literally was okay. We need to visually update Path of Excel one. But there was a very specific thing that was um, uh, that, that was the big problem at the time, and effectively what it is is that. The um the rigs for the uh uh for, for the player characters. We that that's like one of the first things that you'd need to make in a game, right? Because everything like all the character animations and all the skills, um, but also all the armors need to be uh, attached to them and all that stuff. Like all that stuff kind of goes on top of that. So once you've done that, it's something that you really can't change without redoing, you know, everything related to characters. And um we were like, okay. Um, these rigs are from 2006. The people who made them at the time were very inexperienced. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, we also, every player character had its own rig, which means that we were doing seven times the amount of work uh, to, uh, to to support everything that we, that we should have needed to do. And just the overall, um, uh, there were just so many problems with them. It's so funny. To so hear. like, okay, in order to make the graphics of uh, PoE 1 better, we're going to have to change these rigs. So we make new rigs and we're like, okay, now we're going to have to re-rig all the armors. But if instead of re-rigging armors, like, surely we should visually update the armors instead of re of, of, of just re-rigging the old ones, right? Because, like, yeah. obviously, you know, it's like, well, you know, we're doing much work anyway. We might as well just create new items because, you know, those will look better and everything will be better than that. And, you know, we have to make new uh, new, new, new um, uh, animations for everything. Um, so rather than, you know, like, remaking old skills, I mean, effectively, we, need, we might as well be making new ones, right, that are cooler and better. Yeah. So effectively, um, you know, it, it started out there. I just want to point out, look at Jonathan's face. As soon as he started talking about it, I've, I've talked about this before. Like every time we talk with Jonathan, you just see in his eyes, like this burning passion. You can see how happy he is to talk about this. He's glowing. He's radiant about this. And it's like, I'm just sitting here and be like listening. And I'm like, oh man, I'm getting captivated by it. It's so immersive just listening to him. I love that because we don't have that with many other game directors or 
uh, developers in the gaming industry that you can just sit down and have a conversation with and you just get so hooked just listening because of the passion they have for the, what they're, they've made. And he's just talking about what they used to do. And it's like this happiness just glows. It's so cool. And um, at some point we're like, okay, but like the graphics of the starting areas in Peer We One, you know, we like like the first act is like a particularly ugly. We really should like make a new act one, uh, you know, like 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 you know, so to, to make to that look better as well. Because you know, like by the time you have got these great looking characters, but then they're in old environments, like that looks bad. So we really should update that as well. So um, effectively, like we just kept on like more and more things. Uh, kind of like got added and added as like you know, and effectively it just some turned point, into like, a okay. new game. <laughs> yeah, sort of, sort of like that. And so when we even announced uh, Path of Exile Two, yeah. we announced it as like, okay, we're going to have two campaigns because mm -hmm. at that point we decided to redo the whole campaign. We're going to have two campaigns, but it's going to have a shared end game, so that it's like effectively still the same game. Um, and that was kind of what we announced. That's initially what it said on Xbox One. Because at that point we were still in the mindset of like we're effectively just this is a effectively just a giant <clears throat> expansion to Path of Exile that we're making yeah. here. Um, and then, um, and then even later than that, then at some point, um, I, I, the, the point when it really split into two games was the point when, um, I started, um, wanting to make some much more serious, uh, f changes to gameplay feel and to, um, to, to balance and so on. I don't think those necessarily were like it came from, from a specific philosophy that differed from Peer We One or anything. It was just that, like, in order to make these skills feel good, I feel like I need to make these changes, kind of thing. And at some point, um, we started getting a lot of like, um, especially from like uh, QA, who were still mostly working on Peer We One, and like some of the designers who were working exclusively on Peer We One. We started to just get a lot of like, oh man, you can't really change this. Like, it's changed, like, you know, like, like because, you know, people are used to this and it won't be compatible with what people are doing. Like, there was all sorts of, we just started to get a lot of like, pushback on things where like okay it's going to break the game if you make this change it's going to break the game if you make that change due to existing stuff and like just various various things like that just like lots of concern about that from inside the team and so um, i started thinking about it and i kind of just thought like you know what like at, at this point um we're effectively remaking everything um, we might as well just go all the way and actually split um the games yeah. apart from each other and then as soon as we did that it immediately was very freeing because we could suddenly make a whole bunch of decisions that i guess we would have been um you know like like as i said that were hard to make just because of a lot of pushback within the studio about things and like those people it's like well if it's a different game it's like a whole different question right we don't have to yeah. worry about all the stuff from the past you know we can make we can make a lot of changes and um and that's sort of how we ended up with that um but i mean at the same time there was also this um idea that like we did need to make path of exile in order to really make path of exile um grow um to to sort of a much larger audience um we really did have to like there are a lot of people who have tried path of exile in the past who effectively um you know like me for, fell off it for whatever reason maybe they didn't like the combat or maybe it was too complex or maybe they didn't like this that or the other thing six years like, straight i've tried the game yeah, and, sure, sure. and quit <laughs> yeah yeah so it's effectively by um by by putting a, a line in the sand and saying okay we're making a sequel now it effectively means all those people who tried it before and maybe didn't like it are like okay well maybe i'll give this another shot now because you know you were saying that you have made a substantially different game here which obviously we have mm -hmm. um so you know it's a time for then all of those people who tried the game in the past to um come back and give it another shot um, so, um, I think that that, um, is another important element of, you know, making a sequel like that. But yeah. I was just saying yeah, that, that's kind of how we ended up where we are. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's good. All right. Uh, so on that actually, because there, there's, uh, we're going to get into some POE two questions here now, but, uh, mm -hmm. for my perspective, I got some time playing the game. I'm a big ARPG fan. I grew up playing Diablo two as we all did version on my mom's <laughs> computer. She could barely pull me off of it. Any chance she got, but, uh, uh, from my perspective, this game feels like a true evolution in the genre. It's the pacing. That's a good combat, way to put it. The dodge mechanics. What were you guys trying to accomplish with this? With this, because it, it does feel like an evolution. It doesn't play like any other ARPG I've played before. I think that's such a good take. Like it, to me, like that's a really good way to word it. It really feels like the next step in the ARPG genre. That's how it feels, right? With everything we've seen. Now, I will say, yes, I am biased because I'm a big GGG fan. I've played the game for 10 and a half years. I'm definitely biased. I take what I say with a grain of salt. I'll just point it out for the new, new players or new people watching live or if this goes up on YouTube later. Uh, like, yeah, I'm biased, but it really feels that way. And I'm not sure how people who are completely new to the Path of Exile uh, franchise, uh, which is turning into, right? Uh, is uh, what their perspective is, but it really feels like the next step in the in the um, in the ARPG scene. So it really was uh, an effort to make that combat 
feel just like yeah just just much better and i think um one of the things so whenever we launch a um uh, a path of exile one expansion it's always very interesting to see what people say outside of the path of exile community like obviously the path of exile community gets all hyped about whatever the next big thing is but it's very interesting yeah. to see um other communities because what you see there is what people usually the top comment will be like oh you know i tried this but the combat feels so dated and bad and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff right effectively like it's interesting to see what it is that people who don't play poe dislike about poe because that's a very interesting thing to think okay this is the stuff that we can potentially improve um in order to get it better and like i love action games you know like i i'm just a big action game player um so um i just wanted to make something that to me felt like a decent action game you know like i want to kind of be i want to pause that that's something that they've been very consistent about ggg has always made sure that they make the game they want to make and not fall into this box or this trap of listening to the community. Oh, the community was X, Y, Z, skip campaign, do this, get me this, drop me all the loot in the world. And then everything starts to become mixed and bland and shallow and only looks cool at face value. But when you play it, it feels bad. And we have that issue in, in another game that I'm not going to mention because I don't want to throw more shade on that since they're already down bad. Uh, well, you know what I'm talking about again. Um, but GGG has always done that. Now they're listening to the community. They're always doing that. But they will never implement something based on exactly how the community says. They will take the feedback from the community, and then they'll find a way that fits what they want to make so that the game is how they see it. And I think it's very, 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 very cool to see how they're managing to do that whilst policing the community and making sure the game still maintains this high quality standard that they want to achieve. Be able to, to, to have the best of both worlds. I want to be able to feel like an action RPG mm -hmm. um, as far as like all the stats and like, you know, interesting stuff like along the, the traditional like looter type mm -hmm. game. Build um, diversity, but I also that. want. Yeah, but I also want you to be able to approach it like an action game, you know, um, where, where uh, you know, you, like you've got uh, mechanics that you can dodge, that you can understand, like, you know, you can see everything's got wind up so you can see, like, uh, you know, what, what's going to hit you. You can learn mechanics of bosses. Like, you can effectively, um, uh, I think if, if your character is weaker, you can overcome some degree of that in PoE 2 with play skill. But then at the same time, if, you're, uh, if, you, if you don't have as much play skill, you also can overcome some of that um, by getting more stats and doing more grinding. So ideally, we can kind of get the best of both of those worlds. But mm. um, yeah, I mean, it really just comes down to I'm an action game fan. I want us to be um, good on the level of an action game. Yeah. So actually, this lines up perfectly with this. So one of the things that I noticed actually getting hands on time with the game was that Every encounter that I got into, regardless of whatever character I played or how far I got into the game or how much gear I got or skills or whatever it might be, every single encounter felt meaningful. And yeah. it was in a way, and I, I was talking to some yeah, of the other people the event, and I said that this doesn't feel like a second monitor game anymore. <clears throat> because like Path of Exile, Diablo, these are games I got YouTube up right, on the right. second monitor, I'm watching something else, and I, I, like it demanded my attention at every yeah. given moment. Otherwise, I very easily could lose, even though it was fighting mm -hmm. something that otherwise I could probably overpower. Uh, mm -hmm. Oddly, it reminds me of Elden Ring in a lot of ways, right, right. Because just because it's just that engaging. Um, mm -hmm. How did you guys mail it, How did you guys manage to create that kind of feel? Was that the intention? <clears throat> and what kind of impact do you guys think that's going to have on the gameplay overall? So we really do want to make sure that, especially the first time you play through the campaign, that the combat isn't... And I mean, I think that the word around here that often says we don't want the combat to feel trivialized. Like we want it actually, yeah, like as you said, we want it to feel meaningful. And this has been a really big tension point in development a lot of the time because um, I guess there's several reasons for that. So one of them is, is that if you're not expecting that as a player, that is like a very big different game feel. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it's a huge deal, right? So and like that's one of those things that I feel like it's really important that people understand is that like um, that yeah like you're gonna have to concentrate on the bosses like the bosses shouldn't be the you know you just walk up and kill them in five seconds you need to like observe the mechanics and engage with them and like understand them and like you know like it's, it might take i remember when i started playing poe at siri was one of the biggest bosses early when i started playing she was introduced with the vault, sacrifice of the vault patch 1.1 this is 10 years ago and um everyone told me minions can't do that fight so I told them to hold my rum and I went and did it. And that's actually one of the main things that kickstarted my entire streaming career, if you will, actually in PoE. It was me being the world first summoner to beat Uber at Siri. Um, but I also remember at a certain point, depending on your year, I was doing it completely wasted. This is a long time ago. <laughs> so I used to drink a lot back then. 
on stream that was completely wasted literally sitting like this like leaning back i'm like completely fucking wasted out of my mind trying to like just run it by muscle memory <laughs> And there's a lot of things like you, when with gear at the later stage, fast forward to nowadays in PoE 1, it's easier to make PoE 1 more of this second monitor kind of game with enough gear to like survive. Like the la latest uh, release we have with the uh, shield, for example, small and shield and the, you know, face tank and tier 17s. So you're just basically just running through and like you, I can literally look at anything else. It's easy to read chat when you're playing that, but it's not as immersive as engaging. And when the playtest I've done in PoE 2 has been quite the direct opposite. It's just been very engaging and very immersive and actually I'm playing the game. And I never really liked like, you know, auto clicker games or whatnot where I'm just literally not doing anything. I'm actually not engaging with the game. But PoE 2 has never really felt like that would ever be the case. But, you know, we'll see how the end game feels once we get to play this on the December 6th. Take you a couple of deaths before you kill a, before you kill a boss, you know, <laughs> uh, like uh, that, that kind of thing. And um, I think that, um, like, yeah, I just, we, I, th I think from a designer's perspective as well, you kind of want, like, you put all this effort into designing a boss. Like, you don't want a player to just walk in and be like, oh, yeah, I just killed it in two seconds. Like, nothing you did mattered. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, this, on that level, we just want the combat to feel like it, to feel like it matters. But at the same time, you do need a feeling of progression through the game, and you do need to make sure that at some point you get to the point where you feel much more powerful than the content. Now, I think the difference is um, with PoE um, 2 versus 1 is that the point where you reach that is a bit later um, than it was in, um, in, in, in PoE 1. And the other thing as well is that um, people have so much uh, knowledge of PoE 1 at this point that they can reach that uh, you know, trivialization point very, very quickly um, right from the start of the game. Um, and, uh, you know, like obviously we've added like lots of content over the years and all sorts of stuff like that. So it's kind of gotten to the point now where POE one combat really just doesn't kind of like matter very much, um, overall, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we were trying to get back to a, um, a, a situation where the combat wasn't trivialized, but then once again, um, there's a lot of tension, right? Like as we are doing testing on closed betas and so on, um, you definitely get a cohort of people who are like, oh, you know. The, the, effectively, the, I mean, ultimately they're finding the game too hard, right? For the, for their level of concentration that they want to put into it. And um, so we really have to just like, you know, uh, do a fine line here. And so ideally what we can achieve is that if you um, are finding something too hard, you can go and grind, you can get a level of power from what you're, um, from, from the stuff, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, look around the world, get more stuff and sort of come back. And that's like a thing that you can do. But ideally, um, we're in a situation where the amount of that you do kind of depends on how hard you're finding the content. So um, ideally you kind of like, uh, do side content to the point where you reach the level of uh, difficulty with the combat that you feel like you need to reach um, before you're feeling comfortable. I got and, you. And um, okay. there's actually a realization that we had um, relatively hmm. recently. Because I was like, I was, there was actually an interesting thing. You mentioned Elden Ring. There's actually an interesting thing I, I noticed with Elden Ring, which is that if I'm playing Elden Ring and um, I try to kill a boss, and I can't kill it, um, then uh, what I do is I just go and um, kill, do some random side content until I feel powerful yeah. enough to come back. You've got to fly on the mic. And that was something that Path of Exile 2 hey, uh, to in. in the closed betas were not doing. <laughs> and I was kind of like, oh, Jesus Christ, this is a fly. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, that was something that uh, Path of Exile 2 players in the closed betas weren't doing. And I was kind of well, why? why is this? Like, why is it that you people just slam their face against a boss again and again and again in PoE 2, where in a game like Elden Ring, you'd go off and you'd, um, uh, and, and you would, uh, you know, go do something else. And the thing that I realized is that in Elden Ring, you have a map that invites you to, uh, like, uh, to, 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 to the idea that there's other stuff out there that you could find and that, like, you know, there's all sorts of stuff on there and you kind of realize, oh, you know what? Um, there's other stuff I could be doing if I'm not enjoying this. And Path of Exile 2, initially, um, the map didn't really kind of uh, bring across any of that. So recently what we decided to do is... Um, Make sure that on the map there's like icons for all of the like side content and little extra things mm. that we've put around the area so that when you open that map you kind of feel like oh there's so much stuff here that i could be doing and so then it kind of just reminds you of the fact that you know if you're if you're having trouble with a boss you're like okay well you know what i'm just going to go off and do something else and if you do that you will get meaningful upgrades because we've also made sure that all of that content has interesting um like fixed drops or just like little things that, that they can do that um, will give you a meaningful upgrade that will potentially make you stronger um so it's funny that he says this because I actually have never touched a Souls-like game until I tried the Elden Ring leading into the DLC. And people told me the, what, what, what's her boss name? Melenia? Mal Malenia? Malenia, I think it is. That she was like the hardest fight ever. And I beat her in like 79 deaths. And Malenia, thank you. Uh, I had bigger problems with Mesmer and uh, the consort. The Rada, 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 
uh, concert boss, DLC last boss. Those were the two only fights I actually had troubles with. Radon, thank you. Um, so the concert of Radon was like the hardest fight for me. But um, you see, last I checked my pants, uh, there was something hanging down there. It's not big, but it, it was some. It was something, and that led me to believe that I don't have a pussy, and um, that means I'm not. Well, <laughs> you know, I don't have a pussy. There's something else. There's balls hanging down there. And that meant I'm not going to go back and re-gear myself to beat these bosses. So I will beat my head into a brick wall till I either, you know, um, log out on real life or uh, beat the boss. So that's how I had to handle it. And my understanding is that most of us, uh, most of us is do treating Yellow Ring that way. Not going back to re-gear and then come back. No, we would beat our head into a wall because we saw people do this with no hit level one characters. And if they can do it, I can do it with whatever the fucking gear I have when I got into the fight, okay? To allow you to defeat that boss. So that was something that we, um, it's not an obvious connection between like, you know, how come people are finding bosses frustrating uh, to like being, oh, we need to improve the map. Um, but, uh, you know, like that ended up, I sort of realized that like, you know, why, why is it different um, between these different games? And I think that was very important. So adding that has actually um, <laughs> the fly is uh, improved attacking the experience, him, I think, quite a lot. Yeah. Um, Jesus. You can't. Just go away. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, man. It's actually it's so it's so crazy that you say that Attack about the map. Of the, flies. The, the wild thing is, I was thinking about it while I was actually playing the game because I had gotten to a boss that absolutely handled me, and then part of me was sitting there thinking to myself, "I'm like, I, I can beat this by skill, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I can yeah. just pay attention, learn the mechanics, mm -hmm. dodge all the mechanics, and do my best not to get hit, mm -hmm. and, and and beat the boss that way." And then I opened the map and I saw there was like a bunch of mini bosses that I hadn't even touched yet. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, let's go ahead and go around here. I'll probably get some skill gems or some uncut, mm -hmm. you know, uh, support mm -hmm. gems off of them, be able to build something out, maybe find mm -hmm. some better equipment or whatever, and then mm -hmm. come back a little bit later. I went, I did that. And sure enough, got better support gems, got better mm -hmm. higher end skill gems and some better equipment, mm -hmm. came back, handled the boss. It was still tough. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say like I, did, I, 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 I didn't have to try anymore. I still had to try. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it, it felt a little bit more measured because I was actually dealing enough damage to take it down within a realistic amount of time. Right. And yeah. well, I'm really glad to hear that that worked because yeah. um, that was like, that was my thesis for how we were going to fix this problem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, I'm really glad to hear that work, but, um, I, <laughs> the other thing as well, like, you. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Go so, away. Somebody get a, somebody get a fly oh. swatter. <laughs> oh, smelling here or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when was the last time you left the office, man? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's back. <laughs> so, um, anyway, what was this is gold. Um, so, yeah, so it, the, the other thing as well, though, is it really did force us to um, create a lot more of that side. It just keeps the game coming. That really helped because um, having all those, like, kind of uh, interesting encounters has just Love made the game first feel sight, so much man. more alive. Um, you know, like there's just, um, yeah. there was tons of cases where we did things like we would, um, so it's funny cause like, so we've got all these bosses in the game. There's like tons of them everywhere, but then we also, um, have, I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm so hooked on this fly right now. I should ask him if they murdered the fly or if they let him live. I need to know. Um, fuck man. Things that, um, I guess, uh, like they're still sort of bosses. I think if you look at um, a lot of games, you, you would still consider them to be bosses. Um, but effectively, they're like hard coded rare monsters that have specific abilities. And a lot of the time, what we've done is we've taken things from like later in the game and moved them earlier to use them when as like, was a, a boss and that sort of area, things like that. So, for example, I don't know if in the forest you found ago. that, um, that, oh, that witch in the witch's hut. Yes. Um, was that a thing you found? Yeah. You did? Yeah. All right. That's where so I got, that, a, I got um, some that, like leveled up potions or uh, flasks. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that, so that Dude. witch actually comes from Act 5. Fast. Um, so uh, we. Uh, the, 50 we, minutes we, of fame, yeah. The regular monsters from Act 5. We took it down. Um, we added this like uh, frost br breath ability. Yeah. Um, and uh, then, uh, like, you know, added a little bit of stuff around, like, you know, you walk in and there's the cold. This is the video I'm looking at. And goes behind you and, like, you know, a few things like that. And it's like really quickly we were able to create a little encounter like that. And if you're in Act 1, um, a random Act 5 regular monster <clears throat> feels like a boss to you. Yeah. Um, Yep. So um, that's like just like a nice way to just add little bits of kind of like we, we've kind of done little things like that all over the place, just like little touches that um, add uh, you know that, that just make the game game world feel a lot more alive yeah. uh, and allow us to drop um, specific items. So yeah, that one once again that one's designed to specifically give you potions. But actually, there's another interesting one with that one, which is that um, I don't know if you found in the previous area there was a. Um, a, a, a little camp with some zombies that drops a, um, a skill gem. You might have missed it. Yeah, yeah, um, no, I got it. Okay, so, so basically, so if you miss that one, then the reward that you would have gotten from that one will and also drop from the witch in the next area. Oh, okay, um, all right. So effectively, so effectively what this means is kind of like a catch-up account where we can effectively say, okay, there's all this random optional stuff around. Um,
we talked about this on stream multiple times before. I, I told Jonathan at one of the two playtests I did in LA, and I said, one of the cool things is that I always feel like I'm getting enough character progression in terms of gear and power to handle the next uh, you know, threat in front of me. And it felt very natural. And he said, it's funny that you met, like, he, he just lights up like a light bulb. And he's like, oh, Gassy, it's funny that you mentioned that because we did this, this, this. And he explains what he's talking about now. I had no idea. If he wouldn't have told me, or now like he's telling everyone, uh, uh, like if he wouldn't have said anything, I don't think people would have really realized that that's a mechanic in the game. And it's not like the game is communicating and showing and telling us that. It's just literally right there, making it feel very, very natural. Um, and I like that. Uh, if you miss some of it, then we can forward some of those drops on to a later point so that um, we can still sort of make sure that you, at, at the beginning you sort of have a, a, a reasonable... Like we want to try, what we're trying to do there is we're trying to make sure that the, the, the bottom of the... Of, you know, the people who are the most unlucky, effectively, uh, still have a reasonable experience. Um, yeah. So uh, that's the kind of thing that we can do to... Uh, there's like little, little tricks like that that we can do to um, make that more interesting. That's, that's incredibly smart, and it worked, so... <laughs> there you go i'm happy your plan worked there so actually uh, along with like missing content and stuff like that i am the quintessential new player for path of exile i've tried the game mm -hmm. like six times over the last six years mm -hmm. uh, i fell off every single time it wasn't until Settler settlers of kalgur that finally mm -hmm. got me mostly because i could respec using gold right 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 that's that's really what it was i couldn't <laughs> tell you how many times i had bricked a character just because i couldn't right, figure right, out right. how to build i get like to the end of the, com the campaign or near the end of the campaign yeah. and just get <laughs> smashed um you guys have made a lot of changes that have mm -hmm. made the game far more accessible it's obvious that you're mm -hmm. trying to aim this towards newer players uh, mm -hmm. how do you guys manage to balance something that is going to be good for new players while still keeping the game the same for those hardcore players that they've come to love for path of exile yeah, so it really comes down to trying to remove um, in what's called incidental complexity. So effectively, you have um, what you might call necessary complexity, which is effectively in order to get the depth that you want, there's a certain amount of complexity you need to be able to make the system work at all. But then also you have incidental complexity, which is effectively things that are complicated where simple... Oh, we fucked my C, folks. Five tier one subs. Are you trying to bankrupt me or something? I mean, I appreciate the love, but... Damn, that's a lot of subs. You must really be enjoying the stream, huh? Or maybe you're just trying to make sure I never have to work a real job again. Thanks, I guess. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I told, for those of you watching this on YouTube later, I told chat there's about to be ads play and I can't delay them. Inferno Odin <laughs> gifted a tier one subscription to Last Shadow Rider and included the message. Inferno Odin gifted a tier one sub to Last Shadow Rider. <coughs> they have given 31 gift subs in the channel. And the AI alerts is going nuts. Thank you for loading. Thank you, Mike. C Fox as well. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Info right. loading gifted a tier one subscription to Afreact and, and included the message. Inferno loading gifted a tier one sub to Afreact and they have given 32 gift subs in the channel. Okay, let's continue the video, shall we? Or should I pause the alerts? I'm gonna I'm gonna pause the alerts so we can keep watching. Because this is gonna take forever otherwise. <laughs> Find them doesn't change the depth of the system at all. Um, Thank and you guys. a great example of that is the way that um, skill gems work, where previously skill gems were on items. It meant that uh, every time you upgraded an item, you had to worry about your skill gems. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't change anything about the options that you had for what, how to combine skill gems or anything like that. So effectively, I would class that as incidental complexity because it's something that made the game more complicated, but it didn't change anything about how what you could actually achieve in the system in terms of like how you like what the ultimate um, way that you you know the combos you can do anything about how you build a character. All it did was just get in the way. Um, so effectively, what we're trying to do is just remove all that stuff that's getting in the way that's not uh, making the game deeper, while uh, keeping all the stuff that does uh, is necessary to make the game um, interesting and um, have interesting depth. So um, if we can do that, then I think that we will have something which, you know, new players are going to find um, a lot more friendly. So, um, yeah, like the skill system being a great example. I mean, things like making respects easier and gold and stuff like that, like that stuff all really helps. Um, like uh, there's just um, a lot of these things. And, and really, um, you know, like what, what we were doing before, um, you know, it, some of that stuff just wasn't really necessary. Um, mm, yeah. You know, we could, we, to, it, it was not improving the game uh, to do it that way. So. Um, the 
the answer there is like you know yeah effectively yeah i believe that you can have it both ways but at the same time like i never want to make a decision that's going to make the game um less deep and it's very interesting because like obviously that can be um uh that can be something that um you know can mean different things to different people so like the, here's an interesting one that was like a, a, a one recently that we changed which was that we changed from five flasks down to um from having five flask slots that you could do um whatever you wanted with um mm. to having uh just a, a life slot and a, and a mana plus slot yeah and um getting rid of the piano keys yeah, yeah exactly so you could look yeah. at that obviously we're trying to solve a real problem because th that one actually came out of the fact that whenever i was actually watching new players play the thing that they would screw up the most was using flasks um, like they would press the wrong button, they'd do one that was empty. Would, there was all sorts of stuff that they'd be doing there that um, that, that just wasn't uh, that, that was causing them to die. And I was like, at the same time, you've also got the whole flask piano thing, which is like, you know, uh, not great. And um, but the thing is, when I first when we first said, okay, well, what if we just had um, you know one mana and one uh, and one uh, life life slot? The first reaction to that is, oh, you're simplifying the game, you're dumbing it down, this kind of thing. Like this is something that we have to be worried about. So um, then it's like, okay, well, how can we have a system where we can bring back some of the interesting build choices that you felt like you had before um, while um, not bringing back all of the annoying garbage that people had to do and, like, all the stuff that was making uh, new players fail? Yeah, the, the physical um, and, actually having to use the potions part. Yeah, exactly. So that's yeah. when we thought about, um, uh, okay, well, what do people really want the um, variability of um, their flask to be able to achieve? And the answer is they want solutions to things like getting frozen and, like, you know, fire, like, burning and this kind of stuff they, they they generally using those flask slots for um things that aren't even life and mana so then we're like okay so we're going to add this new system called charms and they automatically trigger and they still give you some interesting build choices but they don't require the physical dexterity of having to um you know of, of having to hit all these different buttons all the time and knowing which one to press um and so like that's another great example of like okay we can do something which is like we've got a way to keep the depth but we've also got a way to simplify things down and make things easier and mm. along the way i actually think it actually improved some things about build choices too because um the uh a flask with um is uh the mods on flasks are much more of, uh important to think about choosing between when you've only got one flask of each type like if you've got five flasks um then uh the mods kind of are fade into irrelevance because it's like yeah. well who can they just i'll just make it blue and whatever mods i get i don't really care and like sure maybe there's a couple that people uh, seek you know like instant healing and that kind of thing but um now when it's like you've got one life flask it's like okay you really care about what mods those are and like there are different choices now about like well what am i prioritizing here um about uh, about what i want in that flask so um, i think that actually improved depth in some ways as well so um, that's just kind of a long rant about a very specific system there um, yeah. to give you a no, kind no, no. of example. But effectively, that's the kind of design process we go through when we're thinking about like how can we improve things for new users without actually breaking any, like removing any depth for the um, high end players while still having mm. all these build choices that are going to matter. I like the charm uh, system the long that you added for those sites. So I, really I think cool. that's really smart because the thing is, is that looking at the charm system for the potion specifically, mm. is that you guys not only simplified it, but then you actually ended up creating more depth in a system simultaneously oh, yeah. so not only did you make it more accessible for a newer player but also now more seasoned players have to balance mm -hmm. okay well i'm going to be doing this uh, i want to make sure that i have fire resist or i want to make sure that i have frost resist or whatever it is and i have to fill whatever gaps with my build that i have well that's how i'm going to mm -hmm. you know use my my charms now they're hunting for charms or they have charms mm -hmm. that are filling up their uh their stash tabs and whatnot <laughs> and uh and and i think that's uh that's really smart that's smart i like that a lot um so as a, another one of my like new player uh new player things is that when i always came back in to try path of exile again obviously every single time it was around a new league mechanic mm -hmm. and this last time that i got through um settlers of the sellers of calgar was very easy to kind of get to get to get used to it's something similar yeah, you've seen right. in a lot of other games and whatnot so it was, it was mm -hmm. pretty familiar to me uh but when i actually finally got to the end game for the first time got to maps mm -hmm. and everything like that i was yet again lost and my only <laughs> uh my only solution was like two or three hour guides from you know zizrain or somebody right, like right, that right, right, right. right and i'm like it's not really what i wanted to do i try to play games as blind as i can mm -hmm. and i was wondering when it comes to the end game do you guys have any do you guys have any plans to maybe nudge new players into the direction of maybe end game solutions that are best for them or right. are there ways for players to be able to discover that? 
So I think that um, the end game, the, just the question. core system in um, PoE 2 is a bit more understandable and discoverable. And uh, the way you can kind of see, um, you know, so you, we've got the, um, the, 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 the map that sort of shows you um, what you can find. And so it really feels like you get a more of a sense of discovery and you kind of slowly get introduced to the different mechanics. Um, like you're going to start finding those sort of extra league mechanics um, uh, you know, like you're going to see them on the map before you get to them. You're going to be like, oh, what's this? You go there, you try it out, that's kind of thing. Like you're not just going to randomly run into like 10 different weird mechanics that you've never heard of, like right from the get-go. Um, so effectively that allows us to kind of more slowly introduce those things. And all of those things, I think, have a much more considered ramp about how, like, how you get into them and how they go to go forward. Um, you know, we can effectively make sure that um, there's tutorialization for them at the point where you encounter them for the first time. There's just a lot more that we can do around that. Um, so I think the system itself is just a bit more amenable to um, making, making that ramp into the end game um, a little bit easier. But um, the ultimately, the end game is where things the complexity does start to ramp up a little bit. You know, yeah. like that is uh, something that um, you know is definitely just going to be the case. Um, that's where you start to you know because like especially as we add more and more content to it, um, you know that's where that you're going to start to get all these things sort of coming in. But um, as I said, the, there's a bit more of a consideration to just like you know how the ramp up works. Um, and uh, like, I think. Um, the other thing as well is that um, if you just want to concentrate on one mechanic as well, um, that's something that you can do very easily in PoE 2. You can do that in PoE 2. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pause there. Like, they have so many things when it comes to the mechanics and everything that they first offer is helping people get a grasp of understanding without needing third-party sites or tools or guides. And I think that's really good because the game is telling the players the information they need. They have recommended skills and support uh, like for players when they choose a new skill gem that is for the class they're playing. Might not be the best, but it's recommended it will work. Same thing with support gems. When you open up a support gem, they will list the support gems that you can get that works for the skills that you have equipped, for example, which allows you to have a much better player agency in the way you're playing as well. But you can choose to bypass this and pick something else, of course. And it's the same thing when it comes to like actual end game mechanics and whatnot. They are giving players so much player agency in these things that it's actually fa fabulous. That's the only word I can think of. Like it's just fabulous. Is it gives you the players the option to cater the way they want to play the game in a way that they enjoy it. And again, a lot of people miss this factor when it comes to in the gaming industry in today's day and age. Is that we're not there to be super competitive and it's like you got to meta grind and play the best, the best, the best, the nothing else. The game, it's a game. Just make sure you have fun when you're playing it. Explore and enjoy it. Be uh, be shocked. Be surprised. Have fun. That's the whole point of playing a game. You're supposed to enjoy your time in there. And that should be the focus. And I feel like the GGG giving us the player agency is emphasizing on that feature. And I love that aspect. Here we won as well. Yeah. But um, like the, the, the way that you do that, I think, is a little bit more obvious uh, in POE2 as well with the way we've got the tablets and the towers and stuff like that. Like, I think that the, that, that, that the notion of like, okay, I'm going to just do breaches and I'm going to like, you know, try and seek this out. I think that's a bit more obvious too. So, um, you know, and then also the, the progression systems for all of them with the, the different trees, um, that kind of also, I think, um, just splits the complexity uh, out from it, you know, into, into separate areas. So you don't have to like worry too much about the ones that you're not doing right now. Um, so I think that sort of helps as well. So I'm hoping that will improve things. But I must say that the end game is where we've had the least amount of uh, closed beta testing stuff done. Yeah. It's only recently that, uh, you know, we've been able to get uh, people testing that at all. And um, so uh, that means that we've got the least information about how new players react to that. Um, so, uh, you know, that I think is going to be something that we'll find out more as we get in, as, as we go into early access, honestly. Um, you know, like it's a sort of... Uh, a you know, it's 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 very hard to get people in like a one week beta test to be able to get all the way to end game and like you know engage with that and the people who get there are going to be most hardcore users anyway. So um, yeah, there's like we'll that, 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 be very interesting to see how new users react to that end game system. Yeah, for the for the end game stuff, at least what I saw from like the presentations and whatnot, uh, mm -hmm. I, like I'll immediately say I think the map system in general is like light years ahead of what it is for poe one it's so much right. more like easy to read and understand and mm -hmm. see what's going on than it is in mm -hmm. uh in path of exile one but it's and a lot of that more, like, catered to the interface and ui for the the maps as well i think that that helps out quite a lot interface uh, and ui so, is so important uh, path of exile seasons have always uh have always seen a lot of players come back it seems that uh, it seems that it's always an actual event a uh, momentous mm -hmm. occasion there's a ton of people that file in you got a bunch of people streaming mm -hmm. it on twitch um, what do you guys think is the key to maintaining that long-term engagement that you guys see with Path of Exile? So I think there's a few elements. So one of them is the thing that I already mentioned before about, um, you know, the full economic reset being, um, really important. 
Um, but the next one is as well is that um, our just general view on maintaining a game, um, and I think this is something that the industry is more generally coming towards now, but only in the more recent years, is coming to the understanding that you don't want to keep players around forever. You yep. want to give players a good experience that they're going to enjoy for, you know, like a few weeks, a month, maybe six weeks, something like that, you know, like some amount of time that's like bounded. And then, um, and then you're happy to see them go to play other things, uh, and then come, and then they, uh, no, in the knowledge that they're going to come back again later. Um, so, um, like, you don't have Very to hang important. on to players forever. And um, I think that that I'll say this: I played Path of Exile for ten and a half years. In the start, the first couple of years, I played so much. I have two accounts, and I have twenty-eight thousand plus hours played in Path of Exile uh, with two accounts. Now, obviously, a lot of those hours are AFK hours, just be playing something else and having the game up in the background to do trades. I'll say that. But I have a stupid amount of hours in this game. And I can't bring myself to play Path of Exile for three, four months straight. I just can't. I'm done after a certain time. And I'm like, that's the way you see most of us PoE streamers. After a certain point of the league, we start playing other games. Or we start weaving, having 50-50 streams with PoE over to something else. Like, that's what we do. And it's because you can't do it. It's You burn yourself out. It gets boring, right? And that's what they're talking about here. Give us a good experience. And then we play something else. Then we come back refreshed for the for the resets. A mindset is something we've had for quite a long time, um, and um, it's something that um, you know just I think yeah, just much better for the long term. Like there was a period, you know, when the MMOs were big, where it's like you know everyone was trying to like hang on to players for the longest amount of time. They were all subscription models, so it was like mm -hmm. the, the interest was you know keeping people around forever. And um, I think we it all takes a while, while. For kind of <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah. It takes a while for that mindset to kind of go away. Um, and it's sort of very interesting to see as well that um like uh, and this is kind of a weird uh, maybe a weird connection, but in the mobile world, for some reason, I feel like they still treat players very much this way. That it's all about like, they want to try and keep players forever. Um, and as I said, I think that it's kind of something that is um ultimately self defeating. Um, because players will just burn out. Um, like you really at. would much rather give them a satisfying experience than like, okay, you know what, I'm done with this, but I'm gonna come back again later. So I mean, that's like um one really important thing I think for sure. So do you guys um, think that your monetization has something to do with that? Because like I'm gonna pause the video again. This is a long one. We're gonna watch the finish of it as well. Again, big shout out to Legendary Drops for this video. He actually launched it rather recently. I was told to uh, to react to this. It was po posted two hours ago, so we're really early on this. Links in the both streams here, so do check him out. Make sure Algorithm gets help by subscribing, liking, and commenting. So if you like the uh, the uh, interview that Legendary Drops is doing, do him a favor. Hit the like button, subscribe for more content from him, and leave a comment down below as well, um, which I'll do after the video here. It's like, you guys have a very like player-first approach to your monetization um you guys are i mean especially in the like free to play realm you guys are you know a, a rare breed to say the least yeah that's true um how much of an impact do you think that has on it i mean i definitely think that comes um a lot to sort of play a trust um you know like by by not being aggressive building up goodwill by making sure that we um you know everyone what what people what we do feels fair um i think that it just means that you know players trust us and they're much more likely to um spend money just on the idea that um, you know, you know, I'm supporting the game that I'm enjoying playing. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, look, I'm sure there are things that we could do that would like juice our monetization significantly beyond what we're doing now. Um, but uh, we wouldn't enjoy doing those things. And I think that ultimately be self-defeating. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's much better. Pay to just attention, do what we do. folks. And honestly, like um, monetization Lizard. is something that like it's not our first thought when we're coming to design things. Like our first thought is about designing the game. And then monetization really is like, OK, like uh, obviously we want to make some cool stuff there. But it's like really the first thing is like first make a good game, and then if the game is good enough, the hope You're is that players will want to support you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the hope is that players will want to support you uh, yeah. to, in, in, in what you're doing. So um, yeah, I mean that's kind of always been our view on it. And you know it's funny even at the start. So we we, we started the game in 2006. Um, Can we get some like claps in the channel. It. And um, this is why time, we like free to play so was really not a thing in the Western world. Get some claps in the channel, boys. And uh, the reason why we. Uh, 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 chose that is because we kind of thought you know well we're not we're not some big studio we're just some random dudes in new zealand you know um like if we uh, i don't think we can even get people to buy our game and like how would we even distribute it and like all this stuff like we, we were like we couldn't even do this so free to play felt like a way for us to be able to actually get an, uh, an audience um but then what we, 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 the only examples that we had were all of the pay to win things that were going on um in asia at the time 
So um, we were like, well, obviously <laughs> nobody the time. in the yeah, we were like we were like nobody at the, in the West would yeah. ever accept anything that was pay to win. Clearly, yeah. right? That's clearly and not okay. That's kind of what we were thinking about at the time. So uh, we were like, well, so obviously we need to do all of this um, cosmetic stuff that we do. Um, so that was kind of like um, our thinking um, back then. And it's funny because it turned out that actually Western gamers will accept uh, pay to win in a lot of cases. There are like a bunch of pay to win games that are successful in the West after all. <laughs> yeah. But um, our thesis, our whole thesis at the time was like, you know, nobody would accept this. I mean, we wouldn't accept it, right? As players, like that's what we were thinking. Um, so therefore, um, you know, that was the monetization model that we picked. Um, I, and um, yeah, that's kind of, that was our thinking. I think that in a I lot like of that. ways that the, like the player first approach, not going the pay to win approach and things like that, that you've seen with many other games. Well, there have been some successful ones that are out there. I think especially recently, you know, I'm not going to name any names or anything like that, but there's a lot of live service games that have come out that did lean on those pay to win systems, or they were a little bit too aggressive with their monetization. Maybe it's, they monetize too many things. Maybe they monet they price things too high or whatever it might be. Uh, especially there's when some there's expensive games that are MPXs like parallels though. of each other, right? You have there two are. games that are basically like the same thing, but one is sixty you know, bucks for a pair way of more wings. expensive to play than the other mm -hmm. one. I think that it builds a lot of customer loyalty more than anything else. And mm -hmm. uh, like, how do you think that loyalty like really plays into like the longevity of your game? Before he answers this, I want to say that because of the way they're structured, the monetization, they build not just loyalty and trust, but most importantly, goodwill. So when PoE, and they have had some horrible situations in the past, when they do something bad or something poor happens or something excusable happens, like server launch issues or 315, 319 leaks, for example, Arch Nemesis, when those things happen, they get a lot of negative feedback from it. They get criticized for those things. And they make amends and they solve it, right? But because they have such an insane amount of goodwill built up before these things happen, people are like, this is bad, fix it. They fix it. And once it's fixed, it's like, okay, thank you, you fixed it, now we can move on. Other game companies, and I will say D4 in this case, don't have the buildup of uh, loyalty. They don't have the goodwill built up. So when they do something bad, or when they have like the launch of the expansion, having hours long downtime because of the server issues and all those things, or technical issues, what then happens is they don't have the situation happening where, oh shit, server issues is something we basically can't expect with these huge launches. I'm sure we're going to have some launch issues for the early access as well. It's gonna, it's bound to happen. But if you don't have the build, goodwill built up, that's under the microscope. And you're just looking at anything that's bad. And they're not getting excuse for it. They will continue getting shit for it. If this happens, which I'm expecting them to have some sort of server issues on launch, it would be crazy if they didn't have it. Uh, they're going to be like, oh, this got to get fixed. They fix it as soon as they can. And then they're going to be like, okay, it was a rough start, but let's go. We're good. We're moving on. We're, we forget about it because of the goodwill. But everybody remembers the bad launch of D-Force expansion because they don't have goodwill to have that excusing something that happened that was bad. And I think that's very important. Like, like I said, I, I've seen a lot of these games basically come out and then fizzle out really quickly because of their monetization. I mean, it, it absolutely does factor into it. Like, no, no doubt that it does. But I mean, um, you still at the end of the day have to make a good product, right? Like it, re like the gameplay itself is king. Yeah. And I would say that the main thing you don't want is the monetization to be getting in the way of that. And monetization really can do that because um, the moment that you monetize something, um, the game designers are influenced by the existence of that yeah. thing. Like if, the, if you're selling a certain thing, um, like even if you don't even realize that you're doing it you're going to be making game design decisions around making it so that people actually uh you know buy that i think so, battle um, passes are probably the best example of that where they like you, you they're curbing all of the gameplay around how you progress a battle pass and things like that right 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 so um yeah like uh that's why you've got to be so careful what you decide to monetize because it will affect um uh what what, what you do with other things and i think that's almost inevitable um to an extent that um uh yeah like like it, it's it, it it's like it, it it is so dangerous to do that stuff because yeah it just it just affects you so much and i, I actually think mm -hmm. there's 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 a thing that um in my mind is connected um by the way here that um uh it's not technically the same thing but you know how a lot of live service games will have like oh like play this weekend and get double drops and play this weekend and get two times experience and this this kind of like stuff like that like that stuff i think really undermines the integrity of the game um very Double XP weekend uh, exists in a game that I'm playing off stream with our community. Uh, this game <laughs> in Tibia, <laughs> they have double XP weekends.
<laughs> significantly in the long term. Like, but it's an old like, MMO like, from like, 97, sure, that weekend, though. A bunch of people will turn up. <laughs> but then I feel like then you're like, when you don't have that, now you're much less likely to play. And so then you get into this death spiral of like, okay, well, the only time people turn up is when you start turning on double experience weekends. Um, and so it's like, now that's what the game is. And it's like, you've kind of compromised the whole thing. So it's like, even just that, like stuff, that, that's not even really to do with monetization even. It's just like another thing where it's like, a, it's an outside element outside of the gameplay. You're using marketing to push gameplay. Yeah, yeah, that shouldn't be there. And I, I, I really hate that stuff. And like, I mean, you, you like, People will all the time suggest this kind of stuff, right? Like, and you, you get this with um, like third party publishers as well, where it's like you'll be publishing in a market and they're like, oh, we want to be able to run an event where blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, we just will not do it. Like, in, in the long term, it just breaks things. Like, and, and they'll say, look, when we do it in this game, we get so much more players. And it's like, well, yeah you do that uh, weekend yeah. <laughs> but um you know like it's 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 just not good in the long term so we never do that stuff and um like uh i think that um it's, it's one once again another one of those things that in the long term i think you um is much better for the health of the game yeah, i think that like generosity is always a good thing to have in <clears throat> games and maybe it's not like double xp weekends or anything like that because obviously i i i wholeheartedly agree with you that it it has a negative impact more than a positive in impact mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. Uh, you know, I, I brought up like Warframe re like earlier. Every single day you log into Warframe, there's a reward that you get, no matter I think how long you play the game. And sometimes that reward could be like a 75% off of the, uh, you know, premium currency for the game or something like that. So mm -hmm. players always feel rewarded for logging in all the time. So, you know, I, like I think there's different ways to go about it, but mm -hmm. yeah, for sure, that's... <laughs> That it's definitely not the way. You know, one thing Here's that I definitely wanted to make sure to bring up as well is uh, I'll be real. The uh, the carrying over all microtransactions from POE mm -hmm. one to POE two is unheard of. <laughs> it is uh, most companies would probably see this as an opportunity to be able to double dip, uh, wow. to be able to you know yes. have their existing audience pay for all new things all over again, yep. start over fresh. Uh, in, a, in an Fucking entirely different microtransaction based. ecosystem. Uh, what was your guys' motivation to, uh, you know, what a lot of companies would probably look at as throw away all that money? So I think there's pro like three or maybe even four sort of things going on here. So one of them is um, having started from a position of this is an expansion to Path of Exile 1 certainly was part of the, like, part of the initial sort of um, thinking there. But the other thing as well is that, um, okay, so... Let's let's think about sequels to live service games that have existed. Now, every time that people have done sequels to um, live service games, and um, there's not like that many of them, no. um, a lot of the time the sequels end up doing worse than the original game. And I'm, you have to go back a little bit for some of these, but effectively, like, uh, it's not always the case that the um, sequels do better. But what had been the case before for all the sequels to live service games was that um, the original game effectively took a um a back seat and no longer received any development and effectively you know was dead and we're like well why do that right like why do yeah. that when we have something that there is an audience for that that, that people love you are playing it today right so I'm like, right so i'm like okay well in order like w when you're a game designer um you think a lot in terms of incentives right it's like okay like because like just as a general mindset as a game designer you're like okay because every every time you design anything you're like okay what are the incentives to the player what's this? i'm also thinking about like what what are the incentives that we as a company will have um depending on how we structure this so i'm like okay if we make sure that the microtransactions <clears throat> span across both games that means that as a company we will have an incentive to make sure that path of exile one um, continues to receive content because we will still be getting monetization from that because yeah. the feeling that players will have is that um, POE1 is still getting, uh, like, because POE1 will still be getting monetization because of the fact that all that stuff goes back as well as Ford's, yeah. um, that means that we'll always be incentivized to um, to support it. So effectively, I wanted to, like, build into what, like, the company's, like, what the company is doing a way to incentivize us to do the right thing here. Um, and so that's, like, part of the reason why um, uh, we did it that way. But there, there's one other point as well I want to make, which is that um, um, when you do run a live service game, you kind of realize that like the stuff, I mean, look, the stuff that's selling is the new stuff. And I don't think that like reselling a bunch of stuff from the past to everyone again um, is necessarily even going to make that much money anyway. It's like, sure, I mean, there's stash tabs and stuff, and that would have been like a short term injection of cash probably if we'd done that. But um, fair. Uh, re really in the long term um the, there's two things that are going to give us more money one of them is like you know getting new players 
um, and those new players won't have paid us any money before, so they've got nothing to carry over. And the second thing is, um, you know, keeping people interested in playing the game over and over again through all the different leagues, and thus, you know, buying supporter packs um, through each of those times as well. Mm. And um, people having all their old stuff carry over really doesn't matter for those things, right? Like, if, if our goal is long-term success um, yep. of PoE2 and 1, um, then... This uh, should take it, fucking it really, notes on this. You know, we can we can make this, and I don't think it should really hurt us at all um, in, in, the, in the long term. So I think just, like, for several reasons, it was the right move to do. Um, and um, obviously players, um, you know, are very happy about it as well. Um, it makes the people who um, played the game before feel valued, and, like, you know, we're not just going to throw this stuff in the garbage whenever we decide to do something new, which I think is very important. You know, there's that feeling of, like, we actually care about all that stuff that we sold you before um you know like so i think that that um all of that stuff combined really does just make for you know to me a no-brainer decision um so this wasn't a difficult decision at all it was something that was very obvious to us right from the yeah. point when we decided to um to, to, to make poe2 and um you know we uh yeah so i guess that's the sort of the our thinking behind it yeah no i i think it's great my stash tabs thank you by the way but <laughs> <laughs> uh it's uh no, it's it's just a it's an interesting direction to take but I, I like I, I full I wholeheartedly agree with you that it, it seems like a no brainer decision to just go ahead and transfer transfer things between the two because I think in a lot of cases for like the existing POE audience, you're gonna have people that are gonna play both. Mm -hmm, for sure. Right? Like they're gonna go back and forth between the b between the two of them and they're gonna spend money on both of them. Uh sure, and, and again, I think this kind of goes out. back into this like conversation of like you know, when you treat players like that, when you make things so accessible, when you uh, Twitch chat, death run to say, and uh, this is the difference between public companies and passion project, private companies, public ones are just investors demanding quarterly money goes up. That's very true. I kept saying that, that Blizzard have, especially with the Microsoft juice money wallet injections, uh, have the possibility and they were in a position where they could have made the best ARPG game the world has ever seen. However, they can't. Because what they would have to do is they would have to tell their the board in the board meeting they would have to say, "Yo guys, listen up. Uh, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna spend an obnoxious amount of money and time, and we're gonna lose money for the next coming couple of quarters. But in return, we're gonna skyrocket the value in the next coming seven plus quarters. And if they did that, they would get sued by their investors and their shareholders." They would sue them. Literally, they, they would also legally be in their right position to sue them. To deliberately lower the value of the company. Even if it means uh, like actually increasing the value. They would get sued by their, uh, by their uh, shareholders. That is literally what would happen. Um, and as a result of that, we are never going to see Blizzard do something like that. That doesn't mean Blizzard is not capable of doing something good, which they have been struggling with. I'm just saying that is the problem. PoE is now running here games. It's owned by Tencent nowadays. And Tencent has a tendency of wanting to have control over their Chinese client and the Westworld. Do whatever you want. And then we'll just make money out of that. That's why, that's why we haven't seen any indirect impact from Tencent. I would arguably say that Tencent actually have had a positive impact, if anything. Um, and that's why we see the games, like directors like Jonathan being so passionate, putting this in a, in a, a sequence where they're like, the money is not the main priority. Making it the best product they can is the main priority. And then they will make money as a result of that. And that is why we get such better quality of the product. You don't make a situation where it looks like you're just trying to take money from them at every given turn. I think it, it builds a relationship in which they don't feel like they need to spend money. They feel like they want to. Like they want, exactly. to, they want to support you. And I think, exactly. that that's, I think that's something that's really important. Uh, this exactly. this ties this ties into like a conversation. This is more of like a philo philosophical thing on my part. But you know, over the last couple of years, I've noticed that there's been uh, there's been a trend lately where I think that a lot of companies are trying to strike a either strike a balance or try to trend in the direction of like younger audiences and different. You know, people like to say the the mythical modern audience or something like that. And <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that like great games just seem to land well right like like mm -hmm. elden ring is a game that's played by ages probably 13 to like i don't know probably folks in their 70s are, have, have played elden ring like it, it, wouldn't it, surprise it, me. it really does cover that massive group of uh of people and <clears throat> i think that in a lot of cases they 
the industry is kind of losing sight of how like older players are not aging out of video games like they would in other industries. So like they feel like they have to target their games towards something else. And I noticed like uh, the first thing that caught me off guard was when I logged into Path of Exile and the first thing that happens is all of the other characters get hung. <laughs> and, <laughs> so it's like it's not a game that immediately wants to treat you like a child. Like it has its right. tone. It knows what its universe is and what its themes are. Um, you know, how do you think you strike that middle ground or do you think it's necessary to strike a middle ground with an audience? Well, at the end of the day, what we're doing is making a game that we enjoy, right? Like we're making yeah. a game that we think is cool. And um, I think the danger really comes um, when you try to make a game for an audience that you're not part of. Uh, this is what I talked about before. They take feedback from the community, but they make the game they want to make that they, they believe in. And that's not always resonating extremely well with the community, but the result is we get a good, high-quality game out of it. A lot of people want the screaming for a campaign skip. They're never going to give us a campaign skip. Like, it just will not happen. And as a result, we have a good quality game, because I'll be honest, a lot of those things would not do well for the game. Um, like, I think that's where um, you start to make things that appeal to nobody. Um, you know, because you prob probably the people you're trying to make a game for that aren't you feel patronized by whatever it is you're doing. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the and, 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 and <laughs> there's and, a lot and, of and, examples and, and, of that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you don't, and, and also you don't, um, you know, once again, you, you, you just don't know what it is they want. Like the only person that I know, like the person I know the most, what they want is myself, right? Yeah. Like I know exactly what I'm looking for in a game. Um, and so, and, 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 and also like a lot of, you know, the people on the team as well, like, you know, like, the people on the development team really need to like what it is they're making. So, um, as I said, we're making a game for ourselves primarily. And um, I think if we do that, that we will find an audience of people who are like us, who um, enjoy this kind of thing. And, um, yeah, we do enjoy, you know, like darker themes and like doing, you know, like 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 fun stuff. Like just I, honestly, it's just really fun to do this. Stuff. The, the, the most fun that our artists have are when they're... Um, uh, like making things that are more extreme like uh you probably I, I guess uh you you probably didn't uh uh oh no we did we show you in that presentation um yeah. the black chambers that has all the crazy body, ho body horror stuff and it's like they had so much fun <laughs> yeah. uh just like oh yeah yeah what do we get this guy and just like pull his intestines around <laughs> yeah. a crate like a, you know yeah. around, a, around a gear train like you know like stuff like that they're just like oh, you know and like, they're like slicing the guy in half vertically I, the, so you the, minute, the, the, yeah, the minute yeah, i yeah, saw yeah. like the, the um, cheese grater yeah. machine i was like thanks <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, it's like, oh it's like the, there's a smile on the artist's face when they're designing stuff like that so um it's like and you know and if they're enjoying it then the players will enjoy it so um you know like i, I think that's um really what it comes down to just you know ta target yourself like make stuff that you think is cool and um then uh, so long as there's enough other people like you out there then uh you, you'll get a big audience yeah okay okay uh uh let's see here um these are uh uh we're, we're into the we're into the bonus round here Have a here we go uh path of exile oh this is a really good one so Obviously, long-standing game. There's a lot of narrative and story elements from Path of Exile 1, a lot of world-building that's very pivotal mm -hmm. to this game. It's picking up off of the events of Path of Exile, obviously. Uh, how do you guys approach storytelling and in a way to keep players invested, but also, uh, you know, with Path of Exile 2 coming out, how are you guys going to, you know, onboard those new players that maybe won't go play Path of Exile 1? So as a starting point, like you really can play through PoE 2 and understand the story without um, knowing anything about PoE 1. Like it is the same world. There are going to be some characters who repeat that kind of thing. Like if you played PoE 1, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff there for you. But um, we do have to make sure that the story is kind of feels engaging um, to someone who just didn't uh, experience it before. I think one of the things that's really interesting with storytelling in an action RPG is that you have to be really careful not to be overbearing. Um, and um, like there are cases where um, like... We expect people to play through the game lots of times, right? And so, like, if you have a lot of, like, uh, you know, so, so the quintessential thing that a lot of games do, uh, most games do, is they'll detach the camera from the play, you know, from, 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 from the play uh, position, you know? Yeah. And they'll, like, do things like you talk to an NPC and it comes down and you've got stuff like that, right? And I think for a game that you play through one time, um, that stuff is very effective and works well and it does help with engagement in the story and, like, that, that's a good thing. But the moment that you do that, when you've got a campaign that you want people to be able to like run through quickly 
just taking the camera away from where it is and putting it somewhere else immediately makes it feel like a chore to engage with all of those NPCs and everything. Like in POE 1, if you want to, you can burn through like all of that story and quest stuff like very, very easily. Mm. And so we're kind of trying to make sure that in POE 2, like we had this sort of difficult challenge of like, we want people to care about the story more than they did in POE 1, but we also don't want to have that feeling of like, oh, you like made the campaign this annoying process to have to go through. Um, and um, I think that that is something that some of the games have run into, and so that, then they start to think, oh, you know, we need ways to skip it. Like, it drives all of that stuff, right? Like, we want the um, we want to try and do both. So I think that um, what we've really tried to do is to add more of that story stuff through the campaign in ways that don't are both not annoying but do sort of allow you to experience stuff without having to stop your gameplay. So you've got things like um, as you're walking through areas, you know, like sometimes... Oh, we had the same issue during our, that, my um, interview with the, uh, Dark. Play as you, um, uh, you know, as, 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 as you run through and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> we've also uh, made the, um, uh, like, more, I guess, like, animated story moments that you sort of get to experience without actually having to stop uh, running around. You know, like, you've got things like boss intros and things like that. Like, DMs into, you know, yeah. To, like, tell a bit of a story as the boss is uh, coming out, um, you know, with a few lines of dialogue that can really, um, you know, like, make, 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 like, sell the idea. Um, uh without kind of getting in your way so um i guess that's the sort of main thing and i think um one of the games that inspires me the most and uh strangely enough in this regard is half-life where they always made sure to never break the character's um ability to con uh to uh, like you've got one perspective through the entire game right yeah. like there's never a moment where like you know like where you have a cutscene or you fade out and fade into something else like and I agree with that thing wholeheartedly. Like the oh, moment you do that, you feel I like you lose control that. and you feel like it's a game telling you something rather than you playing something. So um, I actually am a big believer in like keeping the, uh, the, the, the character's perspective um, uh, the, the entire time. So um, that being said, we do have a few things. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, a an intro cinematic that uh, you guys got to see. It was very uh, good. Was, uh, yeah, yeah was, <laughs> the, 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 that was a lot of fun uh, to create, by the way. And uh, there's even a couple more things like that uh, later on in the campaign as well. Very cool. Um, which uh, we'll be uh, we'll, we'll be doing. So yeah, I, I think that the story stuff is is a lot better um, in POE two than it was in POE one. But we still, as I said, have to maintain that idea of like, don't get in the way, don't be annoying, don't like if if you know what you're doing. Uh, don't make you have to do annoying steps. Like, actually, here's another random example um, about this kind of stuff where, like, there's this idea in um, where we have to consider both what the character knows but also what the player knows. So in our, in our, in our storyline, unlike a lot of games, if you know as a player where something is before someone has told you about it then we will allow you to go and do that quest before you know about the quest and that kind of stuff and like we're generally pretty consistent with the idea that like uh, uh that, that you don't have to just talk to an npc just to find something out that the player already knew like that's really important like okay, you don't yeah. like, you, know, you know like like if you can always like you have to go to an npc if you have to like turn in a quest item because they need to like you know make something for you or do something like that mm. but if you already know exactly how something works there is no requirement for you to talk to an npc just to find that out and once again i think that's a bit unusual as I far like as games that. go because um uh m most story games kind of like like the character has to know about something before you're allowed to do it whereas yeah. uh in, in a lot of cases but here it's like it's very important to us that um if you know what the campaign is and you've done the storyline a million times you just go straight there you just do the thing and it's very um you know there's not, nothing in which demon are there instances statue? in which you could actually go and like like take down like a, a, a boss that might be a part of a quest before the quest is actually taken um, yeah, absolutely. That's what happens all the time. Um, so we, we do, in, in some cases, have blockages and things that, like, in, in, but when we do that, it's like, it's because, oh, there's some key you have to get from something and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, so there yeah. are blockages along the way that are mandatory. But generally speaking, um, you know, you can ignore the NPCs for everything except having to turn in quest items, and then you're, and you'll still be able to complete everything just fine. That's um, cool. And go through everything just fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that because, like, uh, the idea is, this kind of goes back to one of our earlier discussions, but it's the idea of, earning the ability to trivialize the game yeah you know what i mean so sure. so like Absolutely. and th and that's something that players like who knew players like to earn things in games sure, including sure. including skill and reputation and items and whatnot sure. but uh, I, like i think that there's something really special in that where you know for these more experienced players once you've run through the campaign a couple of times mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you know i don't need to talk to these people i can go grab this i can go kill this mm -hmm. i can do this i can come back and then take the quest and mm -hmm. turn everything in and then go back to doing what i was doing Sure. That's very cool. I like that a lot. <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. So, just in general, with like with obvious with Poe, you guys have or Poe two. You guys have done a lot of new things. You guys have added a lot of new things. How much freedom do you guys give your team to experiment with new ideas? And how do you guys decide 
what features are making uh are making it into these games um so it is honestly a mix but i guess one of the things i like to do as a manager generally is that um if someone suggests something and um i've got an idea as well then if those things are of equal weight like if i don't have a reason particularly to prioritize one or the other i'll always go with what the team wants to do um over what i would prefer to do i think that's just important because it means that um the team just feels a lot more ownership over you know what the game is and they feel like you know that their ideas are actually getting in and they feel like what they come up with kind of gets into the final product so like it's kind of it's, it's interesting being a game director because you've kind of got this mix of tyranny uh but also democracy in terms of like you know you, you've obviously have to make sure that um the game is going in the direction like I, i'm not going to do yeah. anything in the game that is something that i wouldn't like but at the same time if i'm ambivalent towards something but another team member is really passionate about it um then it's absolutely something that i think that they should be allowed to do because um the uh, it'll, it'll make them like uh, you know much happier and i think also Very the passion much. of the person making the product goes through a lot in, in the final result so mm. um yeah I, I always want to err on that side but if, but the main thing of course that i'm here to say is like you know what um but if i am like no i don't like this it, i really have to just be tyrannical and say you know this this can't go in the game because um you know i, I don't uh i i really have to on some level have some kind of cohesion ar around the whole vision of the thing yeah. um you really don't want it to turn into some kind of design by committee uh, product oh. either so uh, a way to describe this is PoE has always or GDD has always referred to things of having a fully painted picture, and the way it's been described has been like or the way I like to describe it is that they have a handful of people controlling the brush strokes like Bob Ross, right? And their developers are like coming up with ideas and they giving them the paint and they're like, okay, well let's let's do it this way. We'll do these strokes and we'll do this, and then they you know build their steps to create this marvelous end 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 finished picture, right? And I think other companies have the issue where they have different par portions of their company or different managers and whatnot deciding what's going to be on that part of the painting. And then on that side, it's going to be something else made by a different team. They're not communicating. So it just looks really weird. And you get this Picasso bullshit on the screen, whereas this the GDD is working more in harmony and it's going to be a proper fully painted picture that you can look at and, 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 and you know marvel at, right? And I think that's really important for a progression of a game to have the decision making of things that are being introduced to the game are all going to be complementing each other to create a wholesome game that where everything works together and it fits, right? So they don't get this, you know, half the paint is outsourced to some to another portion of the company that doesn't communicate with one another, and suddenly you have this mess on the on your uh, on your painting in the end. Um, yeah, it is a it is a bit of a, a tough balance, but um, ultimately, um, yeah, I, I would hope that the team feels like um, ideas they come up with um, have a good shot to go in. And uh, generally speaking, I'm fairly uh, fine with you know whatever ideas they come up with going. And so long as there's something that I don't think is making the game worse, I'm like, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, uh, you can you know let's go with that. Let's come up. Let's let's do this crazy boss. Let's do whatever uh, crazy monster you came up with. Yeah, I, I like that, especially with the with the boss design and stuff like that. I think that like when I was playing. Uh... Uh, uh, the build of PoE2 that I was playing, like the boss design is something. It's 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 wild how much yeah. you guys have evolved it since uh, since your so last cool. game, or just in general, just for the genre. I, I, it's just so cool. Sure. Uh, which actually it, it brings me to uh, to one final question that I have, mm -hmm. uh, which and this is something that was kind of brought up when we were at the uh, when we were at the event. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that I appreciate the genius of this. But the idea okay. that you guys are going to be releasing the first three acts and then you are going straight into the end game because you guys want to make sure that in early access, the end game is what is getting played. The end yeah. game is what's being tested. You know, end game what's is the motivation important. behind that? Uh, like, I, I feel like obviously Pay attention, part of it Blizzard. is somewhat, uh, Again. Uh, somewhat uh, a no-brainer because PoE is its end game in a lot of cases. These games are right. their end game in a lot of cases. But, um, you know, what are you guys looking to accomplish for it? And what was the... You know, what, what was the mindset making such a intelligent decision? <laughs> so it's funny because you say it's a no-brainer, but it, it surprisingly took us a while to realize um, that uh, that's what we needed to do. And um, strangely enough, uh, it actually happened. Um, like, we changed direction completely to this um, mm -hmm. when we were um, making, uh, when we did the announcement for Settlers of Calga. And so what happened was, so like we obviously had a bunch of in-game plans. We we had a design for what the in-game would be, but um, we did the Settlers of Calga announcement, and that announcement was really huge. And um, it's so good. On the by same the way. day, on the it's same so day as that announcement occurred, yeah. there was also a Diablo Four um, announcement where they announced, uh, I think it was a class they yeah. were announcing, 
And um, everyone was saying, like, oh, uh, you know, Blizzard's making this expansion and it costs like $60 or whatever it costs. And um, the the uh, you look at his the, face. The, 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 <laughs> the, like, of, oh. the content they're making is like oh. not even as oh. large as this random oh, one expansion that's coming out. You know what I mean? Like there was all this sort of stuff yeah. like that. And yeah, yeah, yeah. When I saw that, when I saw that, I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, so first of all, like making a class is actually like a way larger amount of work. Oh, that's a lot of work. Than yeah. than, than, than making than making um, uh, settlers of Calgo was. Like honestly, when you actually compare the two in terms of the amount of work that goes into it, um, one of them is a lot easier. But then I was talking to Mark about this, and Mark was like, well, yeah, but so maybe they should be making more of the type of content like what we're making. And I was like, well, you know, you're not wrong about that. Like, okay, just because something takes more work doesn't necessarily mean that, like, that's the right thing to be doing. Exactly. And then I thought, well, hang on, are we making the same mistake with PoE2? Like, we were barreling forward thinking, like, we have to finish this campaign before we can work on all this endgame stuff. Um, and then I was like, well, hang on, like why are we making all this content that's really hard to make when we could be making content that's honestly easier to make and probably the players will get a lot more satisfaction out of it like there'll be a lot more actual gameplay that comes mm -hmm. you know it's like it's like because like, like when you're making a game like ours it's like you've got this phase where you make um you have to make a bunch of art you have to make a bunch of animation and um, like all this sort of stuff and then there's the phase where like you get to like do a bunch of remixes and reuse and like all that stuff and like an in game mm -hmm. typically is where all that sort of stuff happens and like that stuff is honestly easier to do than making it in the first place. And yet the amount of actual value that a player gets out of that is like in a lot of ways higher. Much higher. So um, much, we were much we higher. effectively we were just like, you know what? Like, um, why are we not just stopping? Like, we need to just drop everything. We're in the we, we were like towards the end of making uh, to finishing Act Four, and we we're like, you know what? Let's just drop everything that we're doing. Yeah, we, we'd already done a pass through the game, by the way, so like a lot of that yeah. stuff's already done. But like we we're like doing the polish work in Act Four. We're like, let's just drop everything and just focus entirely on in game now. Like, let's take what we've been doing with in game and like now we're gonna put the whole company on it. We're gonna stop completely working on all of the campaign stuff that we're doing, and um, we're, we're just gonna focus entirely on in game and um, make that as big as we possibly can. Because yeah, the players will get a lot more out of that. And like honestly, like a three act campaign for for a new player, it's already a huge game. Like sure, we're making a game that's you know that's fifty hours long, but <laughs> having a twenty five hour long game is also still a big campaign right like and, yeah, and, yet, it is. and yet yeah and the, the other thing as well about this is that um if if we have a a bad a bad end game when we get to uh, to early access then we kind of have to say to people hey trust us guys there's a there's a good end game coming um you know you guys don't really i mean we'll, we'll tell you kind of what it is but like you know you guys have to just sort of trust us what it is right um uh but but if we um have a great end game and then um the uh the, the campaign's three acts short well it's like you'd know exactly what another three acts is going to be like because you just played the first three right so it's like you know exactly what to expect when we add that later but um you know we get to impress you with an end game uh, before that point so um yeah that 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 really was what it came down to but yeah it was not really that long ago uh when uh, when we came to do that and um i think that that was a really important decision because um we effectively twitch chat saying this is what happens when a game is made by gamers true and you know the other fun thing about it, by the way, is that now like making the end game for PoE two is like going back to the like making PoE one leagues again, yep. except with resources of the whole company all in one thing. So it's like making seven leagues uh, concurrently, um, which is uh, kind of a crazy thing, but yeah. um, it's been very fun. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's been um, it's, it's been a lot of fun to work on that stuff, and um, it, 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 it's 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 just pretty cool. So um, yeah, it's it's funny because uh, it, in retrospect, it's like obviously this is the right move, right? Like obviously yes. this is better. Yeah, yes. but uh, it did take a little. While and it took that moment of like, well, you know, what the hell are we doing here um, to uh, actually realize uh, that we had to change direction like that? Yeah, because I mean, like from my perspective, when I'm looking at it, it's like, well, you know, story content, it's not like it's it's not worthwhile and, and the work that your folks have been doing on it isn't worthwhile. There's a lot of value in it, but the, ma the vast majority of that value will be extracted within the first couple months of the game releasing oh. and then done. Whereas yep, like end game is the reason why people keep coming back to the game over and right. over and over. But again, also right? a lot of the Preach. value that we get from making that stuff is that we then get to use it to remix it to um to make it an end game. And so like the end game maps that we were showing, like all of them look like unique areas, but all of them are just like done by just like like we've got so many assets through the campaign of the game that we can take and then turn into maps like. Um, when people are making new maps, it really only takes a few days to turn around a new one um, because I uh, like in-game maps I'm talking about um, because uh, in, in terms of the environment, I mean, because they just take a bunch of existing stuff and they're, and they're, and they're putting it back together. And it's like you'd be surprised mm. how you can how different you can make areas feel than, can, than campaign areas by um, changing like the like the weather. remixing a few different, like different tile sets together, taking doing some um, like changing the color of things, changing mm. the um, lighting settings and all that sort of stuff. And suddenly you've got an area that just doesn't feel like anything else you've done. And then you make a few specific 
like bespoke tiles to kind of make uh you know yeah. to add like a specific theme to the area and then you've got a new map and it's like um we can do that stuff so quickly, um, and uh, it, it 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 really makes the end game feel gigantic. Um, you know, yeah. there's just all sorts of shit in there. That, you know, there's so many maps and like interesting things to find. Um, and uh, and the the, the the last benefit is that um, for develop a lot of developers, when you're making content quickly, you just feel so much more productive and it's so much more fun to actually get stuff working. Like the, it's the slow grind that kind of wears on yeah. you over the years. But the, the the whole just like oh man, we're just like making maps left and right. We're like turning out. You know all these systems like it just feels great to do so yeah, yeah i would imagine especially because like i mean you got to think uh, i'm woman I mean, you already do think but with you guys been working on path of exile one for so long it's like going back to the regular grind when you're just going to make the end game content right it's like oh we were already doing this so mm -hmm. that's cool that's cool man cool. I, I i'm i'm looking forward to it i know a lot of people are looking forward to it i think that it's going to be a uh it's going to be a very special game you guys have put a lot of love in a lot of care and it uh even even at a even as an early build that I've gotten my hands on, it it feels transformative in ways that I haven't been able to express properly in words yet. But believe me, I will. Uh, I'm really is, glad to hear that. That's, that's great to hear. Is there is there anything that uh, you would like to say uh, uh, about Path of Exile Two or anything you'd like to say to the audience uh, for uh, for the end of this? Give it a second. So obviously, it's obviously it's a scary go. going into a launch, right? Because you don't know how people are going to react. But um, um, like I think that um. You know, I, I'm really happy with the work the team have done on the game. Like, it's just so. I, I think it's. I think it's a good game, um, and um, I'm just really looking forward to seeing what how people react to it. Like, I just want to see. Like, you know, were we crazy this whole time? What we we're making, or did we actually? Uh, do we have the right idea? You know, like all the changes we've made, all the things we've done. Like, you know, I I, I just want to see. Like, you know, d does it actually? A player's actually going to love it, and I'm, I'm hoping they do. Yeah, I I think they will. I think they will. Yeah, well, I Ben, thank you think. for joining me today uh i yeah. i can't wait for the release of the game i'm sure everybody else can't either i'll be covering it that's for sure there'll be more content that's coming on it uh but uh thank you for joining me today man thank you very much it was nice, right. nice chatting all right boys uh i'm gonna link this in the chat again big shout out to legendary drops don't forget to oh, i unlike it there Oof. here's the video it's in the uh youtube chat sorry twitch chat here it is in the youtube chat Big shout out Legendary Drops. Give him a like. Subscribe for content. And, uh, oh, shit. I forgot to subscribe. There we go. And a uh, very nice interview. Thank you. Make sure you leave a comment. Helps the algorithm. And uh, if you're watching this reaction on YouTube, make sure you hit the like button. Subscribe for more content on this channel as well. And also drop a comment down below. But make sure Legendary Drops get some love. There's going to be a link in the description to his video. And thanks so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Till then, stay safe keep rocking man i i literally forgot to click on the snooze button i can delete